Good evening. Now it's on. Okay. Uh, welcome to this regular meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. It is Monday, March 8, 2010. Could we have the roll call, please? Chair Swift Kayata. Here. Councillor Guvenali. Here. Councillor Jordan. Here. Councillor Lennon. Here. Councillor Sherman. Here. Councillor Sullivan. Here. Councillor Walsh. Here. Time for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Town Council reports and correspondence. Any councillors have reports? Uh, Councillor Sullivan? Uh, yes. Um, uh, in uh, February last month, uh, as the liaison for the open space management um, effort, I met with the Conservation Commission. And um, as a result of what looks like a lot of planning and work towards that, the Commission voted to have an additional monthly meeting that will be focusing purely on open space management issues. So, and the other one is um, um, as the one town concept allocation, um, I know that's on the agenda, and, but I did meet with Mike about that and he's provided a, a, a spreadsheet. But that's also, I just want to mention that is based on various assumptions and I'm <coughs> looking forward to really getting into that on a more detailed level. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Bob Malley and I met with the uh, Recycling Committee last Wednesday regarding uh, the pay for bag and the increasing recycling rates and uh, they have agreed that they would um, be part of our analysis and helping to develop the recommendations relative to pay per bag um, and increasing recycling rates and they are going to be meeting uh, at the end of this month I believe it's the 25th in order to help develop an action plan and then we'll get together the first uh, we'll get together in April and review that so we're moving forward great thank you very much yes Sarah um, the alternative energy committee met with three councillors and a few other citizens I believe on February 25th and they presented um, findings of their work in the form of a spreadsheet and we had a I thought a very productive conversation about uh, the various priorities they suggested um, based loosely on payback time and so forth anyway uh, we asked them to go back and give us one more pass with a different presentation essentially this was Councillor Swift Cadda's idea where each recommendation would be its own page that would spell it out with risk factors and benefits and payback time and so forth and they're going to work on that and hopefully fairly soon have that to all of us as a council so we can consider it. Okay. Jim? Uh, just to update on the uh, Fort Williams uh, revenue issues, we're meeting with the, um, with the manager and the chairperson and co-chair for the Fort Williams Advisory Committee on Wednesday morning for our first session to develop uh, our strategy on the board. Okay, great. Anything from anybody else? No? Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, a number of the counselors were able to meet uh, at, uh, on uh, February 10th with, at the Chamber of Commerce dinner with, local, with and for local municipal officials from South Portland and Cape Elizabeth, and it was a good opportunity for us to have an interchange of ideas with local business leaders, and I wanted to thank the Chamber for their hospitality and putting that together. Uh, I also wanted to take the opportunity, and I'm sure Mike uh, will also, to um, thank our public works and public safety employees for all their hard work during the uh, huge wind storm and heavy rain that we had uh, last week. I know uh, I was out of power for four days and was very, very glad when it finally came back on, and I know all of us have similar tales to tell about trees going down and uh, needing assistance from our, from our public employees. And I just want to thank them because I'm sure they worked round the clock for all of us. Um, so thank you. Uh, 
If that's it for reports and correspondence, we'll move on to the, citizen, the first of our citizen opportunities for discussion of items not on the agenda. And I see Mr. Prince is here, so please step forward and if you could say your name and address, please. And then... Fred Prince, 2 Rocky Hill Road, Cape Elizabeth. Been in the town since 1967. Four weeks ago, I read the Cape Courier. And in it, Mike was quoted as saying that the parking meters would be installed in Fort anyway because the citizens were an advisory group. I believe that statement is... I, I, did I quote you wrong, Mike? Why don't you finish, and then I'll respond. Okay. Because if that was a statement, my first reaction was, and this is not a democracy, this is a dictatorship. In a democracy, the people, like the stockholders, tell the, the town council, the board of directors, what they want. And a few years ago, we had an election. In that election, 65% of the people, that's not a small, it's not a small difference, said they did not want the general public to be taxed for the use of the fort. Now that's what we said. Now I'm sorry I wasn't here four weeks ago, I was in the emergency board. But we're not an advisory board. The management reports to you. If you're going to have an election on this, may I suggest that maybe you ask a few more questions. Because I thought about this, and this is really just a lack of communications between the public and yourselves. And so that as, because there's a lack of communications, you really can't do the job that you want to do, and it's really easier than what you have. For example, what questions would I ask? I would ask the people, do you want the general public to be taxed in any way for the use of the fort? I think the answer comes back resounding no. Should the fort pay for itself? I think the, the, the answer for that would be a resounding yes. How can we pay for the fort by itself? 5,000 runners times $30 is $150,000. When I read the, I did a lot of research this week, uh, this, uh, today, and I went into the budgets. You go back and review the Fort Committee uh, meetings of all 2009, except for once where they mentioned food, it all came out the same thing. Cars coming in, let's tax them. There was absolutely no effort to make a thought on that, to, to, to make any kind of a different change. Sorry. Read the minutes. I did. Another question you might ask the Fort. You might ask the taxpayers, should the fort, which I believe is a tremendous source of income for this town, this is like having a whole bucket of diamonds and we just keep spinning our wheels all the time in the same darn issues. Should the fort pay for more than just the fort? I think they can. I think the fort could also pay for the school sports and other things that this town is doing. I mentioned the idea of, using a, uh, of putting a cemetery down in the fort for, uh, for, for earns. That could maybe generate between 10 and, uh, 10 and 15, 20 million dollars. The interest from that could go to pay other things. There are a lot of ideas. The store generates $500,000 of income for, uh, 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 of, of sales uh, at, that, uh, at that location. If you listen, two months ago, two of the people who bring down groups down there, they said they, they tell the groups, don't go in the store. Why? Because you can't get out fast enough. The bus will leave you behind. Good God, let's expand the store. When I went to Alaska, the cruise buses were parked in front of the gift store. So when the people ran down, saw the site, came back and still had 10 minutes to kill, they went in and spent their money. You can't expand it down, you can't expand it down where, the, where, the, where, the, where the store currently is. It's against the rules. I understand that. But there's no reason you couldn't put it back up against the wall where the, where the outhouses are and park the buses right in front. Good Lord, we are a town of the most capable people in the state of Maine. We should not be having these problems. This should be a gold mine for us. Not something we're arguing about the same thing all the time. But by changing the structure of the uh, fort so we charge the general public anything demeans our town. Mm -hmm. And that's what I object to. 65% of the people said, we don't want to charge the average Tom, Dick, and Harry to come in and enjoy our fort. That hasn't changed. Mr. Prince, if you could yes. try to wrap up. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, did you wish to say something? Yeah, if you'd like me to. Yeah, uh, Mr. Prince uh, referenced, uh, I don't think it was a direct quote in, in the Cape Courier, 
uh, regarding the impact of the advisory referendum. Uh, you know, you, you weren't here the evening the, the council made that vote, but it, it was very clear in the discussion that the town council does consider it to be an advisory vote. Uh, the vote that was adopted that night specifically instructs and says that, uh, that the fees, you know, are to be in place. Uh, it would take action following the referendum uh, for the council to revoke that. Uh, you know, that because it is an advisory referendum, you know, the ball is in the council's court uh, following the advisory referendum to take whatever action. It but then why not make the, re the referendum so you ask more questions than just that one question you're going to ask, which doesn't do a thing. It doesn't answer the question, and it doesn't give anybody any direction as far as where you want to go. That's my, that's my observation. Thank you, Mr. Prince. Okay. Town Manager's Report. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair swift -Kayata. Uh <laughs> Anyway, I wanted to speak a little bit briefly tonight just to, to make a couple of observations. Uh, first of all, you know, it was wonderful to hear those town council reports this evening and also to look at tonight's agenda. You know, it's often questioned, you know, where do issues come from and how do they emanate in this town. And, you know, I think if you look at the agenda this evening, uh, almost every item on the agenda comes directly out of town council goals. Uh, the Employee Health Insurance Review Committee will be hearing about, uh, the agricultural amendments to the zoning ordinance are a goal, the town center issues have, have been a goal, uh, obviously a lot's in the budget that applies to goals, looking at the curtailment meeting suggestions, and the one town, school town allocation concept. Uh, you know, so I, I really think that's terrific that, that, you know, we're looking at the goals so focused and the, the council's been uh, focused on that. The, the other thing, I, I was going to mention that there was one goal that really hadn't been mentioned, but then the, the chair uh, did refer to it uh, indirectly this evening, and that is that the town council will recognize staff and volunteers for their dedication to Cape Elizabeth. And I appreciate that you did that, Anne, and want to pick up it a little bit more. And there's, there's a couple of individuals that I particularly want to recognize this evening. Uh, one is our chief of police, uh, Neil Williams. Uh, I, I did his evaluation recently, and I, I really don't talk all that much about evaluations. It's, you know, you don't do it, and if, you know, if, if there's going to be something negative, would I say it? But, you know, he's been with us about 30 years now, uh, you know, as uh, coming up through the ranks, uh, you know, up to the chief position. And I, w I was looking at the budget and looking at the numbers, and, you know, I, I referred to Neil uh, as he had to do a lot of the heavy lifting this past year. And specifically, if you look at what we were spending for dispatching two years ago, what we actually spent versus what it's in the budget this coming year, it's about $170,000 savings. Uh, there's some language in the budget about streetlights that sort of says it, the initiative was more successful than planned. I forget the exact wording. Neil, you know, it, it ends up, if you look, again, if you look at the budget, there's about a $15,000 savings in street lighting. Third is police overtime. You know, we hear a lot about police overtime. You know, Neil was uh, very concerned about that. I was concerned about it. Uh, we, we had to do a lot of changes in last year's budget. And the amount of the, that's in the budget in police overtime is 22 percent less than it was two years ago. So, you know, if you look at all those things, it's about $210,000 in savings. And that, what's really interesting, it's not one-time savings. It's recurring savings. Over the course of you know, 10 years, that's $2.1 million in savings, all because of what Chief Williams did. And you know, I think we really ought to recognize you know, what, what he did was, was truly special. If we look at the cost of the police department compared to other communities in the region, there's 11 communities we've looked at, we're third from the bottom in spending per capita. And that was before we made any of these changes. Before we made any of them. And with, with having made these changes, we're probably even, you know, almost probably at the bottom in spending per capita for our police department. You know, these numbers are out there. You can look at the, citizens can look at the benchmarks. But you know, when I, I think we see our police officers, we see the chief, I think we really owe him a debt of gratitude for all that he's done. Secondly, I want to talk about Chief Gleason. Um, and why don't I start uh, talking about Peter 
and again, these numbers per capita, because you know, I read these things that we don't know what our metrics are. We don't know what our numbers are. Of the 11 communities for fire and rescue services, Cape Elizabeth spent the lowest amount per capita of any of the 11 communities. It was $45 per capita. The highest community was the city of South Portland. And I don't, I don't mean to pick on South Portland, there's different situations there. But South Portland was $169 per capita. You look at the total budget of the fire department of the city of South Portland compared to Cape Elizabeth. Their budget is about $4 million. Ours, including fire and rescue, is about 264000 It's a factor of over 15 times what South Portland spends for, police, for fire services compared to Cape Elizabeth. So what is, you know, I, I look at that, you know, and Ann mentioned the storm uh, beginning last Thursday night and continuing through. Peter Gleason worked 40 straight hours on that storm. No overtime, all salaried. The, the call company members responded to 77 calls of service. These are the call company members of uh, Engine 1 and Engine 2. You know, it's, we hear we're not doing enough intermunicipal cooperation at times. I don't think hardly anyone's aware that all the basic firefighter training for South Portland's call firefighters are done by the Cape Elizabeth Police Department. The station we have on Shore Road not only responds to calls in Cape Elizabeth, they're also automatic response to South Portland and vice versa. And you look at those 21 volunteers that are down, down there at Shore Road, Cape Cod Station. 19 of them have the full firefighter certification to wear the air packs and to actually go into buildings. Two of them are older now and, and don't have that certification anymore. But of those 21 firefighters, 16 of them are residents of South Portland. All of the offices of Engine One Company are residents of South Portland. Every one of them. And you know, the, the suggestions out there to close that fire station and to perhaps, you know, have them join Willard. You know, they choose to belong to the Cape Cottage, go to the Cape Cottage station and be members of Engine One station because that's where their friends are. That's where they like it. Some of them work here at Public Works, but three of them, I believe, three or four. It's, it's their home. It's, it's much more than just doing the fires, although it is doing the fires. It really protects that whole area of town. And, you know, you look at all these calls and, you know, I think it, it is really unique what they do. And again, they're doing it for the lowest per capita cost of any community in the region and substantially below the two communities on other, the other side of us with whom we might look toward for for a closer relationship. I, I see Mr. Malley sitting here in, in the, uh, in the uh, audience this evening for a later item. Uh, you know, I go back to the storm. You know, I was home sleeping, I have to admit. The power went off and woke up. And you know, the, the first thing I did was, was call Bob and, you know, what's up, what's going on. Actually, we met out here in the parking lot, I think at 6 a.m. Uh, you know, the public works crew had been up all night. The, the roads were cleared, they were, they were in great shape. Uh, you know, it, it, as I look at it, you know, and I think of snowstorms, who, you know, thankfully we haven't had any lately. But, you know, think of anyone that goes to bed 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night in Cape Elizabeth. They're listening to the weather forecast. They hear the s snow's gonna end at two. You know, we don't think for a minute that that road won't be clear in the morning. You know, it's, they're out there all the time, they do it, they're very happy to do it. And, and sometimes, you know, I, I think we sort of take them for granted. Uh, yes, they, they, they are paid, Bob isn't paid overtime, uh, but, but the rest of them are, are paid overtime. And, you know, I, I think so much of what they do with parks, with recycling, Bob staffing the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, uh, Penny mentioned the Recycling Committee. You know, it's, they're doing so many different things. And again, you know, you look at the numbers and, and they're pretty efficient. Deborah Lane sitting over here. Uh, you know, Deborah, this week has probably spent, you know, five hours. Uh, when I say this week, in the past week, at least five hours dealing with citizens having trouble paying taxes. 
you know, people in her office in tears, that, you know, people don't see that. She's, today, I think there were four different candidates or representatives, of, or eight different representatives of candidates that actually came in to have petitions, signatures verified. Uh, she was working with the ballot, working on the ballots uh, for the upcoming elections that uh, Mr. Prince just mentioned. In terms of making sure the absentee, she, she had discussions last week with the lobbyists for, uh, by email with the lobbyists for MMA uh, on huge issues we're going to have dealing with absentee ballots and the timing for the, the budget validation vote. Uh, she discussed that with, with, with Representative uh, Dill as well. Our excise tax, which she oversees, we had the best month ever in February. The best month ever. You know, it was good, it wasn't storm. People bought cars. You know, Deb processes all of that money. You know, we, we, we have one of the best bond ratings around. Uh, you know, the only one that's with us is Falmouth. The reason Falmouth has a bond rating is they have an undesignated surplus that's 15 times ours. 15 times ours. We have a good bond rating because of the good work that the council's done over the years at holding back budgets and because of work, Deborah and the other, the other folks, that make sure the taxes are collected, they make sure they're legally collected, and because we also work with the school department very well with, the, with, their, with their payroll, pay, they pay the bills for us, some of the cost allocation. You know, and it, I mention all this and, you know, someone's saying why Mike's going on and on and on on this. You know, we, we have, t tonight, we have a list that we're looking at, 113 curtailment suggestions, recommendations. You know, if you read them, they want to do away with public works. They want to reduce planning. They want to reduce assessing. They want to reduce codes. I think if you take all those recommendations, the only town employee left would be the pool director. Uh, and you know, if you look at, you know, Peter Gleason and Neil Williams, there's a report on the uh, town website now that proposes eliminating their positions. Proposed limit, and I understand that maybe the, the Municipal Operations Review Committee itself won't accept it, and even the committee that recommended it won't do it. Uh, you know, won't go forward, they'll make it more general. But you know, in the meantime, all of the town employees are out there working with recommendations out there saying their jobs ought to be eliminated or significantly curtailed. You know, it, it's a miracle they come to work every day. Uh, you know, whether they're sick, to, to, you know, to help the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. And, you know, I, I think it was really important that we pause from time to time to remember what they do, and particularly as we look at some of these comments that, you know, they heavily criticized the hiatus that we put on the email, you know, messages. You know, our employees were reading those every day. It didn't make the days go very well with about a dozen people in this town who I think we're in a... I think they want us to be in a race to the bottom. You know, we, we hear about these programs, race to the top. There's about a dozen people in this town who want us to be in a race to the bottom. They look at employees as liabilities rather than assets. They look at employees as somehow what only the cost of them and not the value of them. And I think as we go into the budget season, you know, we, we look at the budget. You know, the reality is there's a budget with no tax increase municipal services. The reality is that spending is only 17,000 more than two years ago. And, you know, th there's almost different realities, you know, that, that folks have. And, and then, you know, they say, well, you know, th there's, there's comments out there now that, you know, we don't know our metrics. We don't know our numbers. You know, we've done benchmarks. We know the metrics. We know the numbers. It's why the town council, for instance, looked at recycling saw we were spending a lot more on solid waste, and they, they went after it, and now in this year's budget, it's $72,000 in savings. You know, it's why you're looking at Fort Williams fees and concessions and all those things is because Fort Williams, and you look, you look at our percentage of the budget, in 10 years, it's getting more and more on the property tax instead of on fees. You know, it's important to look at those things. And you know, I, I do want to conclude with one comment. You know, I've had a lot of praise for the employees. I, and, you know, the council's done with my evaluation. We're not near an election, I can say this. Uh, I have worked in the, the town now. It'll be 32 years in, in May. I've never worked with a town council that's more dedicated than this one. 
and that has spent more time working on things like this health insurance policy, working on the Municipal Operations Review Committee, and you know, look at all those reports we heard earlier. You know, working on so many different issues. The Ordinance Committee, you know, I don't go to the meetings, but you know, Jim and Frank and Dave seem to be here, it seems like every other morning, although, <laughs> although it isn't. And you know what, it is, this council is the brightest group I've ever worked for. And we've worked, I've worked with some bright people in this town. And it's also one that's really balanced in terms of respecting each other's views. And I just think it's sad that there isn't more appreciation for, for what all of you do and what for so many of our volunteers do. And my sense is that the citizens in this town do, in fact, most of them, you know, you're all elected. And I think they really do appreciate the staff. But I just think we react too much to 12 to 15 individuals who, every time we have a meeting, even if there's an agenda, try to switch the agenda onto something else. Uh, you know, that happened a little bit the other evening. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say this evening. The final point I wanted to make is that on the Municipal Operations Review Committee, they aren't meeting next on Wednesday night. Uh, they're beginning a meeting at 6 to review some more of the subcommittee reports. And then they're having a public comment period uh, also on Wednesday night beginning at 7. And if anyone has any comments, suggestions, you know, we have hundreds of them now, hundreds of them backed up. Uh, suggestions, but you know, we're, we're more than willing to accept more and to listen to more, but I think we need to be realistic that we can't work on them overnight, and I think we also need to soften a little bit all of this, that we're going to get rid of this employee, we're going to get rid of that employee, because in my view, the employees do a fine job. So, anyway, thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, I might add, the Comprehensive Plan Committee, um, which did extensive work, uh, for, uh, it was a two-year committee and did a public survey, which is now probably about three years old, but uh, it showed that Cape Elizabeth citizens were extremely happy with the work that their public officials had done, and I don't know about if they referred to their elected officials, but I think they are very happy with the services that they are provided. Uh, by both the municipal employees and by the school department also. So those of us on the council, um, I, I know I speak for all of us when we say we do appreciate very much the, the fine work that the employees do for, for all of us in our community. So thank you for your report. And I do urge people, I wasn't aware there was, um, I, I, I had heard there was going to be a public input session. I wasn't aware it was Wednesday night, Wednesday so night. I, I've been out of town. And so Wednesday night, I encourage people, whatever your views, to uh, come and share your views with the committee. And if you can't, I'm sure they'll accept your views in emails, too. So, okay, moving on. The minutes for the meeting held February 8th, 2010. Do I hear a motion? If I move to approve. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any corrections or is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. The next thing on our agenda is a public hearing uh, with reference to an amendment or amendments to the Code of Ordinances with regard to post-construction stormwater management plans. An exciting topic. I did read through all of it this afternoon. So I'll be interested to see who has comments on this. Not to denigrate those who work on stormwater management, of course. Um, so if anybody has any comments they'd like to make about this proposed ordinance change or um, addition, please step forward to the podium and state your name and address and let us hear what you have to say. I'm not seeing people crawling over each other to get to the podium, so I guess we have no one to speak, so I'll declare. I did want to say something real quick. Okay. Yeah, I just want to thank Fred Morin and Bob Malley for the work on this. If, Ann, you thought it was boring. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> Bob it was fascinating. pretty good at drafting stuff, but <laughs> Sorry, know, I, Bob. I was looking at it, and he, he was muttering one day, and I said, why don't we just get Fred to do it? <laughs> <laughs> Fred works uh, with AMEC, uh, our town engineering firm, formerly known as Oston. 
Fred at one point was our town engineer when he used to work for T.Y. Lynn, and they went off in different directions, and then Fred went off in diff different directions, then he ended up back at our town's engineering firm, and, you know, we're very pleased with that because uh, he, he saved us a lot of agony by having worked on this thing. Well, I, I do want to thank you both for your work on this. It was pure, purely my lack of breadth of experience that led to my not understanding every single word of this. But anyways, I'll declare the public hearing closed. And then are you pointing or are you raising oh, your hand? So, it, yes, Jim. Yeah, I'd like to make a point that um, as a new member of the ordinance committee, we had our discussion, went away, and came back, and Bob Malley brought to our attention a couple of issues that were not covered in our original discussion. So the fact that people wear their work, they, they, they do this, and I think it's in the, in the town's best interest because he comes back and tells us we need to make sure we clarify that new developments only are covered by this ordinance. Mm -hmm. And secondly, we need to describe what construction or under construction actually is. You know, if something's under construction, does that, does, what does the term mean so that there's no confusion? So it's, a, it's an interesting process to work now closely with staff because you really have some talent and yes. you have to add your, your time and talent to the situation but listen to what you're being told by professionals. Well, thank goodness we do have talented people who can work on these things for and with us. So um, that brings us to item number 34, which is the amendment to the Code of Ordinances having to do with post-construction stormwater management plans. Um, do I hear a motion? David. Uh, I move that we adopt the proposed amendments to Chapter 18 of the Code of Ordinances relating to post-construction stormwater management plans. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? I just want to again thank uh, the gentleman in the audience, uh, Bob Malley and Fred Moore, and as well as our town planner, Maureen Amira, who worked with the members of the Ordinance Committee in an area that I don't think any of us felt incredibly comfortable or conversant, but we were very satisfied that this made sense. It's largely reporting requirements when a development is complete and uh, also in part mandated by what the state is requiring. So it, it seemed to us to make perfect sense. Thank Move you. Move forward. Any other further discussion? Okay, hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. <coughs> that brings us to item number 35. Cape Elizabeth Employee Health Insurance Review Committee. Penny, did you want to introduce this? You were on um, that committee. Yes, David, uh, David Hillman, who just stepped up to the podium, uh, and I are going to present uh, the recommendation from the uh, Employee Health Insurance Committee. Uh, I know this is a long-awaited report, and I know how exciting it was to read. It was even more exciting to write. So David, um, David and myself and Matt Sturgis spent many hours together in a room and uh, arguing and laughing and uh, uh, getting frustrated with each other. But I think out of all of that uh, came this report. And I, I would like to uh, thank the committee members, Al Barthelman, Mary Townsend, who represented the uh, school board, Kyle Parrish, uh, Jim Walsh at that time, who was the citizen and uh, a citizen rep, and David Hillman was the chair, chair of the committee. And um, also, uh, Matt Sturgis did an amazing job as uh, the staff person on this group as well as representing uh, the uh, MMA perspective for the town employees. And Pauline, I always get her name wrong, uh, Aportria, mm -hmm. uh, she did a fantastic <coughs> job helping us gather data uh, from the school perspective and both she and Matt were uh, extremely valuable in uh, reviewing all of the numbers because I will profess I am not a numbers person. 
Um, so I ask my uh, financial person over there on the other end to not push me too hard on numbers, Mr. Gavinelli. Um, and uh, I also want to say that we had two, um, two people who joined us as observers at um, many of our meetings, Dwight Ely, who's from the Cape Elizabeth Education Association, and uh, Sean McHugh from Public Works, who represents Teamsters, and uh, both of them were uh, very uh, significant contributors to uh, the work, and they pushed us a lot on some of our thoughts and ideas. So with that, I'm going to, uh, uh, you wanted to do a quick intro. Mr. Hillman. Thank you, Penny. Um, uh, before I get into our report, uh, I'm going to wear two or three hats. First hat would be as a citizen. Um, I'm also a member of the school board, as, you now, as I've now become since this report was started. Um, I did listen to um, Mike's uh, passionate speech about town employees, and we have a great town, and uh, we have to keep our eye on the, on the target that we're doing a good job, we have great people, and that uh, most people appreciate us, most people don't understand it. And I have to say, I, I absolutely 100% agree with everything you said, Mike. 100%. And that's not just based on the recent storm. It's based on my experience with Matt, who was unbelievable in helping us. And uh, Pauline is based on... I think every comment you can make, in fact, and maybe I'll hire you to come over to the school board and make the same speech before our next school board meeting because I think it applies equally to the school and the people who volunteers, our teachers, our employees. I think it's absolutely true of this town. And you said it very eloquently, and I want to, as a citizen, thank you and agree with you for it. Um, now, switching, I'm going to tease the chair for a second. I don't think it's quite accurate to say she was out power for four days, because I did hear a generator from her house. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like going over and knocking on the door. I was out of CMP power, but you're right. <laughs> but I, I just, you know, those of us in the neighborhood who are jealous of that, I just want to You could have come and knocked on my door and asked for a cup of sugar, David. I, I was Should've. thinking of it. But, um, Next time the power's out, feel free to come by. <laughs> Now that's reported. Yeah, Sarah will be, the whole neighborhood will be over now. <laughs> um, now, putting my hat back on as chair of the committee, um, we worked long and hard. Uh, we were, I think, to get it done in February. But I have to tell you, we, we put a huge amount of effort into this. It was an enormous amount of effort. We had a lot of meetings. We uh, staff dug into a lot of information. And Penny is quite a... Uh, uh, a slave driver, we, we got a lot of information to back up everything we thought, but we should say, we changed our minds based on certain information, but it was a, the committee was very well chosen by uh, Jim um, Rowe and by Chris Brigham. We, we had our differences, but there was never a doubt on that committee that we had a common goal, and that made it a lot easier. So I just suggest in picking committees in the future, if you can find groups that may differ, but can do it respectfully, that's what our committee did. And, and recognizing Jim Walsh, who was also on our committee um, a, as well, he can attest to all this. Um, we did, we did a, we're, we're not experts, although a lot, some of us have experience in health law and health insurance and so forth. So um, we did get the assistance of one person that Penny did not mention, but that's okay. We used a gentleman named Rob Kennedy from Arcadia Benefits who volunteered his services and was invaluable in gathering information for us, finding comparables for us, and re reviewed all of our, our um, plans for both the school side and the town side, and gave us observations on both, gave us observations on self-insurance versus uh, bidding process, and with a great deal of help, did it all for free. Um, and even while we were writing the port, as Penny said, three days during vacation and three days last week, I think, uh, he was taking calls from us and answering final questions. So. He was a great help. Penny and I divided this up, uh, and we're going to try to make it quick. It is pretty comprehensive. I don't expect to have read it all in detail, but uh, we did try to condense it at the end in, into recommendations and conc uh, conclusions and then recommendations. We realized our role was merely to make, um, conclude as best we could from the facts based on our expertise, make recommendations. It's going to be up to the town council and the school board as to where to take it. Where to to, to take it, we have recommendations as to 
where we think it should go, but it's obviously up to the two of you. Penny, who did a lot of the process and information gathering and the methodology, will we'll talk about that, and then I will highlight uh, those of the uh, recommendations and conclusions that uh, I think are particularly important, although I think all of them are, and then we'll, we'll, we'll stand here and answer whatever questions you like. Some we might not be able to answer, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. So I'm now punting it back, Penny. Are you ready? Are you ready? I'm ready. Um, and unlike David, I expect that you read it in detail <laughs> and enjoyed every word. Every, um, I've always, whenever I put together documents such as this, I always think that you should kind of put a story threading through it so that at the end you can test whether people have read the whole document. Um, and uh, if I had had time to do that, I would, have, uh, I would have used that approach because then I would have known that everybody had gone through it. But what I want to do is uh, talk a bit about um, what our charge was, how we went about um, uh, gathering information, what some of our uh, initial kind of uh, findings were, and then David is going to get into conclusions or recommendations. Basically, when we set out, what we were looking at is, are the plans that are offered to employees within the school and the municipal um, departments, um, can they be offered in at the same level of quality at a lower cost to the employer as well as the employee in order that we attract and retain our best employees. In order to start testing that, of course, we went out and we gathered um, a lot of information. And I'm starting on page four of the document. Uh, we gathered information on existing um, uh, contracts, health plans from the MEA Trust, health plans from Maine Municipal um, Employees Health Trust. We also looked at health plans and information from uh, uh, private companies. And uh, we also had a meeting where the uh, representatives from the MEA and the MMA attended and they presented uh, their plans and we were able to ask some questions and kind of kick the tires, so to speak. Um, if you turn to page 17, I'm going to start there because basically this starts to outline the existing situation. And what, we, what I tried to do in this document is separate uh, municipal and uh, schools as, as easily as I could. But uh, sometimes things get a little confusing. But anyway, we've got the municipal information from an existing situation perspective. And um, basically what we have are, I'm going to just hit the high points, 55 employees, 47 of which select plans that are offered by Cape Elizabeth. Uh, and that's at a cost of $425,946 annually. And of those 55 employees, 18 of them opt for cash in lieu of benefits, or they do a buy-down at a cost of $54,500. There's then a breakdown of uh, the various employees, police, public works, and all other. If you turn to page uh, 18, what we attempt to do on this page is show a breakdown between the two types of, of plans. We have an indemnity plan, which is similar. It's just a fee-for-service plan. And then we have what's offered as a uh, point-of-service comprehensive plan. The MMA offers, at the time we started this document, offered five different plans. Cape Elizabeth selects two of those plans, the indemnity and the point of service. Uh, they now are offering six different types of plans. What they have added a uh, high deductible insurance plan um, with a health savings account. So they're really starting to move into more of the, um, I would say, consumer-driven health plans. And um, the, also the MMA uh, is, is much more advanced from a wellness perspective than the MEA is, and I think they offer, they're even starting to expand their wellness programs. 
Basically on page 18, what you have is a breakdown by plan, uh, whether it be employee, employee spouse, employee plus child, uh, and family plan. As you'll note, the cost sharing is uh, either 90-10 if it's in, uh, an employee only, but 80-20, meaning that 80% of the benefit, 80% of the premium is paid by the uh, employer and 20% by the employee. If you go to page 19, uh, that summarizes uh, once again the total annual cost of the uh, municipal, the MMA plans uh, for Cape Elizabeth and um, at a total uh, cost of $518,759. Now we get into the schools. And the schools through MEA offer a standard plan, which is really a preferred provider organization, and a choice plus, which is a point of service. Um, they also, if you go to page 20, we have 286 eligible employees for the school, 235 of which uh, select benefits. There are, uh, the school offers, uh, 51 of the employees opt out of the benefits. There is, uh, there is not an in lieu of payment offered at this point uh, for school employees. You'll note the uh, breakdown of the employees by class uh, and that um, for teachers, administrators, the cost share between uh, employer, employee is 88.12 and for ed techs and uh, other classes it's 85.15. Um, if you go, basically the total cost, where is it? Uh, the total cost of the school, to the schools for its share of uh, both the Choice Plus and the uh, Standard Plan is $2,538,800. Uh, $2,538,840. Um, in the uh, appendix of this document, which I'm not going to go into, is a, uh, two spreadsheets which outline by class and by uh, plan the breakdown of uh, employees and the uh, premium. What we did next is we basically said, okay, if that's the picture, if this is a picture of what um, the plans look like today for the town. What does it look like to, for other municipalities? And we did a quick look at other municipalities. Now, um, MMA plans um, are fairly standard, and the uh, communities can select from five of those plans. Many of the communities select the same plans that we do. And so therefore, the premium's the same. The only difference is the cost share, or if they happen to offer in lieu of benefits, and what type of in lieu of. Uh, with the uh, MEA plans, the premiums is the same, no matter uh, what school uh, district, and the plans are the same. Uh, once again, the only difference is the cost share, and whether they might offer in lieu of. So what we did was we said, okay, let's look at a comparison to private companies. Because if we look at, our objective was to see if we go outside of the trusts and go to, uh, and, and bid, the, bid the plans, bid the pool uh, for benefits uh, just directly to the insurance company, what might the results look like? And so on pages 24, 25, um, what we did is a comparison, and what we tried to do is we said, okay, let's find a company that has approximately the same number of employees, that has plans that are similar to what we would offer, and so we took and uh, we identified a company with a point of service plan that was very similar to what might be offered uh, through MEA. And what we ended up finding is that on a 
month, if you look at the chart that shows um, item number two, schools, and you see the breakdown on page 24 of employees, uh, adults, employee, child, and family, and you see the Cape Elizabeth point of service plan rate, and you see the, the uh, other the law firm, uh, you will notice that the premium on a monthly basis, the savings would be approximately $24,478. So there's, there's somewhat of a significant savings there. Um, if you go to page 25 and um, you look at what this could look like, the potential annualized savings for this plan, um, you're looking at $293,650. Um, if you take and you look at the municipality um, and you take the same point of service plan and you compare that to the plan that the, um, the employees have, I just found a mistake in the report. Um, if you find the um, employees of the municipality and compare that to the same POS plan, you're looking at potentially an $18,413 savings. So our conclusion in just our rudimentary analysis is that there is potential for significant savings by taking our plans, and uh, David will get into what those conclusions might have been and what the recommendations would be. But at first blush, it looks like there could be significant savings if we shop the plan. Thank you, Pat. Don't ask me numbers. I'm not going to ask anything. Can I make a suggestion, though? No. I think, speaking for myself, I skipped straight to the conclusions and recommendations. Well, I and I plan to go back and study the rest in great detail. <laughs> But I'm assuming that all the counselors read these three pages closely and carefully. And therefore, would it be a more efficient use of our time to go straight to questions? Because I know I had a couple. Or is that that idea? So you don't want me to talk? Is that it? Well, after you talk, then questions. I'm afraid it's going to. I'll I'm do it any way you want. I'm just saying the questions, I don't know. For me, I already know what my questions are. But if people, other people don't want to do it that way, that's fine. What's your pleasure? Would you want to I, I'd be fine with Sarah's approach. Not that I don't want to hear you talk either, but I did a similar thing and went right to the, it's like going to the end of a detective novel to find out what happened. <laughs> well, I'm glad you did it because that's the part I wrote. <laughs> Which spoils the plot, but I guess we don't want to hear the whole plot. So, Well, um, before you ask questions, can I clarify a yes, couple yeah. things? Yes, if, if you think the there's some the key points that we should no, know. I don't even give a summary. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with it. I can handle questions. Um, I, I want to highlight the dollar amounts for the audience because Penny gave a lot of detail and um, there, there are two things. The, the potential savings for the schools in its employees is about $360,000, which breaks out to about three hundred sixteen dollars for the school side, about $43,000 for the teachers, which is about $225 per teacher per year. Uh, municipality is 18 gross, 14 for the town, 3,000 for the employee, and 82 per employee for sharing. Now, obviously, those sharing change as you share. The other thing is, there isn't an HMO. We can only compare a POS to a POS. And that's a point of service plan, which is basically like an H I'm explaining to the audience now. Basically like an HMO, but you get to go out of network, but you basically pay about a 30% copay, which is the... Uh, um, uh, is what the, um, the, the discount, excuse me, the discount that the provider is giving to join the HMO. So they're basically very similar. This, however, didn't even assume an HMO, which I think is a very viable option, which would be in any plan, which is in the law firm's plan and all the other plans look at. That saves significantly even above these plans. That's about $1,000 a year cheaper, picking the family, which is the most expensive one, than the POS plan. So the savings could be dramatically larger than what we're talking about here. We just couldn't price it because we didn't have a comparable in the um, Teachers Association. They don't offer it. And I talk in my recommendation conclusions why they don't offer it. And there's a big debate about that going on. The superintendent Bangor debated with them. Um, and now they, they have come out with their, about 
a 2% raise, which I will flatly state, I believe is the result of meeting with us and being cross-examined for a lengthy period of, quite, <laughs> quite a length of time by so somebody on that committee that was the who asked a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the fact that they're getting pushed by other towns on self-insurance. We, we recommend a, a different approach, but I would tell you that raise would have been a lot, I personally believe that raise would have been a lot higher this year if they weren't getting pressure. Did you want to explain what they were doing to fund the increases on an annual Well, basis? one of the things they do, they, 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 keep, they, they, they raise, they, had a, they didn't raise the rates last year. The way they did it is by taking money they've, they've accrued over the years and, and uh, difference between premiums and costs and create a reserve. They, they drew down a large amount of that reserve to be able to, to offer uh, a zero percent last year. They obviously can't keep doing that. <laughs> so. so it's artificial. So how do they do two this year? Well, they, that, they still had reserve. They still have some, and, yep. and the, answer, I, the, the true answer to that is I have no idea, but I can guarantee you they can't keep doing it. Yeah. They cannot, uh, one of our conclusions is flatly, they cannot, if you divide Southern Maine versus Northern Maine and you have a, a, a Cape Elizabeth alone plan or a, a regional plan, there is no way they're going to be able to compete on a statewide basis. This happened with the Maine State Bar Association. We used to get all of our plans through a statewide association. Various firms in Portland said, well, wait a minute, let's go bid our own. Found out we made enormous savings and we broke, I hate to say this, but we broke the trust. Everybody started doing it and we stopped subsidizing Northern Maine and the small practitioners and everybody else. Uh, and that's just what happened. And I think that's inevitably what's going to have to happen in the towns. The legal barriers and so forth we're going to talk about, but that's just the reality of Southern Maine versus Northern Maine. Sarah. Okay, can I ask you a question? Uh, Actually, I have what? three, but I'm going to roll it into one. So you say it's essential that we hire this uh, outside expert. My question is how much would that cost? And then my second question is, I had understood that if you're a small business, you pay larger premiums because you have to account for the one person gets a, a very ill and it bumps it way up. So the larger the pool, the less risk the insurance company takes and therefore you can contain costs. Is that right or wrong? And my third question is, why can't we do the HMO thing? Um, okay, I'll see if I can remember. The first question How much was... How is an expert cost? Expert. An expert costs nothing. The broker that will come in will basically do a huge amount of work and they get paid up by the insurance, whichever insurance company wins the bid. But they are, they are in essence working, well, the bro a brokerage is, a, is an unusual animal, but it costs the town nothing to answer that question. The second, second question was, is it not more expensive if we self-insured because we're the equivalent of a small business, which is much more expensive than... Okay, you added the key word, self-insured. One of the reasons why we don't think it's... I have to tell you, we found that there was such significant savings going down the competitive bid route with private insurers that, and we looked at self-insurance, we did not look at it in as much detail because it didn't seem to be a viable alternative because we could do just as well by direct contracting. We would not have that risk. We would not have, and the way you make up for that risk is significant reinsurance costs. And third, you don't have the very expensive cost of managing your own plan. That takes a lot of administrative overhead. When you could do it directly with an insurance company, it just did not seem to make sense to us. And the, and the fourth one is, um, I, I just believe that, um, uh, or we believe that uh, the risk of, of one or two people blowing your thing and then the following year getting an even higher reinsurance rate just didn't seem to make sense. Direct insurance can do that even though you're a town because they are the insurance company. They don't have to reinsure. Yes, they rate you once they get the utilization data, which is one of the key problems here. But in essence, they spread it over their entire pool. So they don't hit you the same as if you're in self insurer So what pool, sorry, what pool would we be in if we didn't choose to go with the one we're currently in? We could shop around and... We, what, what we would do is hire a broker and bid out with Aetna, Anthem, uh, Harvard Pilgrim, and they would bid against each other. We would, our broker would design the plans to be similar to what we have. We can decide on what car sharing and all the other various recommendations we have in here about how to make this cheaper. Um, and then we'd bid. And our pool would be, we recommend it be all the employees of Cape Elizabeth. And that is about the same size as our, our best comparable, which was a law firm. And they had a unique feature, which is why we picked them they include in their pool people that have retired as being, having the right to be in the pool as long as they pay the full premium. That distorts your pool because they're much older, but that was why it was the best comparison. Uh, 
And the reason why there is not an HMO offered by these two trusts, and will never be offered by those trusts, according to their own lawyer, after <laughs> much, to, yeah, much, much cross-examination, yeah, yeah. I was told it was called, is that they can't do it on a statewide mm -hmm. basis because in Northern Maine, there's not enough competition. They're not going to join an HMO and give a discount. So they don't offer HMOs in Northern Maine. It's very rare. They can in Southern Maine because there's plenty of providers, both on the facility side as well as on the individual side. And there's a lot of competition within Southern Maine and Southern Maine versus New Hampshire and Boston. So. Frank. Um, first of all, thanks for all the work you guys did. This is an amazing result. Um, and it's clear, it seems to me, that there's opportunities for a lot of cost saves. Uh, but it does seem like there's two critical elements to this uh, for us to be able to go forward. One, you noted that the plans that you're looking at are roughly equivalent to what the employees are already getting. And that's your, your assessment. Mm -hmm. Do they also share that point of view? Um, related to that, what will it take to get the unions to accept a new plan and um, specifically the possibility that plans would offer? And then three, you noted in here that the MEA Benefits Trust has refused to disclose the claim data, which is critical to us to be able to go forward. What's the timing of being able to get that changed? Well, do you want me to answer that, Penny? Because it's within the recommendation. Start, and then I'll okay. Add. Um, it'd be a little bit helpful given how lengthy your question is. And I'm, I can pretty short. Sure. Short question, Dave. Yeah, but there's three, three questions in there, Frank. Come on. <laughs> what does the union think about this? Well, the union, we haven't asked specifically the union because it wasn't appropriate. They were, they were in the meetings with you. They were at the meeting. They were uh, simply uh, um, um, uh, advisors, I'll call it. They were observers. Um, I cannot answer for it with the union. Uh, they did not specifically say, I will say that the union representative was very curious about the savings, was very curious about, and this was solely, on, not for the union, but his own, would very much like to see an HMO, and I think he said that during the meeting, and uh, quite frankly, it's up to the people negotiating. Uh, I think they have loyalty to the union, but by the time we got done with our presentation, uh, with the correct answers and the correct way to do it, um, it's a, quite frankly part of the negotiations with the union, but I don't see why that would be a significant roadblock. If you, for example, if I was negotiating it, I would do it and I'd say, okay, you have a choice. We'll give you a flat sum and we can get you superb insurance based on this flat sum or you can go to your union and use that towards your premium. And it's how you negotiate. So this is part of the contract negotiation. Correct. Teachers' contracts have another year to go. The principal is various stages. Correct. David, correct I, think, I think that one of the uh, concerns that was brought up by um, um, one of the representatives was that um, that if we go if we go direct, that um, would we switch insurance providers? Um, every couple of years, and that becomes very disruptive from a, um, an employee perspective. And so what he wanted to feel is be assured that, you know, we aren't going to be flipping people around, um, that we're going to try, to, to try to stay fairly consistent. The other read that I got was that um, as long as the benefits offered weren't uh, that varied from what exists, then uh, if they had a realized a cost savings themselves, then that was a pretty good benefit to them. I, I, I would agree with Penny. I would add a couple of things, and, and Dwight can always correct me if he wants to. I, I, I have talked to people on an informal basis. I can't believe that our teachers or, or our, or our uh, municipal employees, if the town gets a chance to save money, all the things that Mike said earlier, if the town gets a chance to save money and they get the same thing, for why we, there is loyalties to the union and it's going to be a lot of pressure put on by the MEA trust, my guess, is to hold ranks because for a variety of reasons we'll need to win to. But um, um, I, I think it could be successful. I, I so, think it could, but it's a guess. So then it's a question of having them disclose the claim data. What's, you described some of the processes, but it's well, very lengthy. Two, oh. two, two answers to that, if I may. One, you can still get a, a rate on a community basis. You, they still could community rate us and give us a premium. It will not be as cheap without claims that, simply. 
So we may achieve some savings, and then after a couple of years, we have enough claims that of our own that we can do it. That's one alternative. The other one is they, and one has to guess, but they didn't turn it over to us at our meeting, and looking at what happened in Bangor, they've given a lot of reasons, um, and as I said in, as we said in our conclusions and recommendations, a lot of these reasons, um, I don't know if will hold up, quite frankly, and that's why we suggested hiring a lawyer or work with the insurance bureau or checking out a law which several brokers says that says they have to do this. We quite frankly ran out of time to figure out how much you'd have to do to get that. Ultimately, can you get it? I, I believe you can. And ultimately, if you can't, by various lobby methods, by passing a law um, in our state legislature, uh, which they may be very favorable towards because it's the way the towns can save money and they pay less than the EPS system. There's got to be a way to do it. Uh, so we had no problem getting our data from the Maine State Bar Association. Maybe the fact we were law firm that we got our data, but I also believe that all the people want it one way or another is through insurance bureau, through state legislature, and maybe as a result of their own plan, they may have. I, I can't believe they don't have a right to their own data. But secondly, their other reason they give, at least they gave in Bangor, was we only keep the information on a statewide basis. I have to tell you, I think we explained in there that that we don't, we don't quite excuse, buy that one. Excuse me, Michael. I, I just had a, a, a brief question. I, did you not find that the municipal labor union contracts, the two in the personnel code, do have quite a bit of flexibility for substituting plans of equal yes. benefits? Yes. I got the yes. first penny on that one. Yes. 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 So, yes. I just, so the municipal, there's, there's flexibility written within the contracts yeah. mm -hmm. and the personnel code to switch to alternative right. providers. It, I, the municipal side is, is so much easier to deal with, and the uh, MMA was extremely willing to share whatever they, they could. And so it, it, was a, it was a whole different... Uh, uh, in, in fact, the MMA uh, charges their premium, which is why it's slightly lower, is they do 20% of their premium based on utilization data of your particular town. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not to say that our union won't be very supportive of it. I think they may very well be. It's the statewide union that so far has proved to be the issue. And just finally, no more questions for me. Um, so if, we, if, the, if the town council agrees we want to pursue this, What's the next step? Do we hire someone who sort of goes forward what, on it? Or? What, we were, I, what we were talking about uh, as a committee is that if a combination of uh, a couple people from the town council, a couple school board members get mm -hmm. together in a kind of a subcommittee of both and uh, then work with identifying a broker and then starting through really working through these recommendations and I know David's going to hit me for this but I would offer that when we're working with a broker that uh, that we need to be open to the uh, new ideas around uh, consumer driven health care you know plans we need to say Throw, see what self-insured looks like, what it might be. Yes, look at HMOs, but I think we've got to look at what, what's out there and what's possible and offer the best plans to the employees. It's, if, if I could just I wouldn't hit you for that, Penny. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. We don't want violence in the council chamber. <laughs> we get pretty violent. <laughs> um, I think the idea of a committee is, is a good one, and I you know, sort of skimmed through this, but I would like to spend, I personally would like to spend some more time on it. And there is uh, a specific time during the budget process, early in the budget process, because it's account number 170, which is all employee benefits, where it seems it's the perfect place to be discussing this in more detail than we can during this meeting. I think all of us have more questions. I think we do need to move on. Um, and so I would suggest that um, we delve into it more deeply in whatever that meeting is. It's the finance meeting. Yes, it's coming right up. So rather than... make me come back? We might make you come back. I mean, we'd invite you to come back. I thought I'd done my make you do anything. But, um, but it, it seems to me that 
that way we can just, uh, discuss the pros and cons of all the specific recommendations. There's quite a lengthy list of recommendations, and rather than try to pound them out during a televised uh, meeting here, we do have a number of other things on our agenda. So if, if that seems okay to the uh, council. Jim. And just it, as a citizen representative, again, I, my compliments to David and to Penny and to Pauline and to Matt for really, really going the extra mile. They spent hours getting this thing together, keeping us all on track, and we started out a little, a little far afield, but I think the activity was a, a pretty meaningful one, and I think all of us got a tremendous education, and I think we can only take that to the next step. But I think to these two in particular and the staff, they were, they were fabulous. Well, it's, it's a huge portion of the budget for both the municipal side yeah. and the school side, and it does sound like there are opportunities for some real savings here. So just as sort of a process thing, I would recommend we move on. I do want to officially thank the committee, yes? Oh, I was just going to make a motion. Oh, when I, I, I was starting to make a motion, but no, go no, ahead. No. You can I, make a motion. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. I, I, I thought you were sort of leading to asking for a motion, so I was just I was going to charge right forward. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to officially, uh, on behalf of the Council, thank the committee, and I know we'll be working more on this, and um, make motion that we just refer this to the Finance Committee um, to be considered at our upcoming meeting when we uh, consider account number 170, and that way we can uh, discuss it in much more detail and come to some consensus about what to do. So do I hear um, a second for my motion? Second. Yeah, any further? Discussion? Okay. Um, it's been moved and seconded. And oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Prince. I didn't see you wave, waving your hand. I was going back and forth, left and right. Would you like to say something about this? Uh, this is good news. Th excuse me. Thank you. Wall Street Journal. I'll leave this with you. Just reported that the state of Indiana put in a health savings account, and the health insurance costs went down. It's an exhibit, I believe, to your packet. Yeah. Oh. Is that, did we get, did we yeah. did get the yeah, I think we it's in here. It's in Thank you. We, Thank we have that you. as an exhibit. To Thank you. Evening. We already have yeah. this. Well, Thank you very much. Um, so it's been moved and seconded. Any further comments? Hearing none. All in favor? It's unanimous. Great. Thank, Thank you again. You. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. Thank you, David. We'll see Thank you tomorrow you, night. <laughs> same time, same place. Doing the school book presentation, right? Oh, I was going to say, it's the finance committee <laughs> tomorrow night. Uh, Don't get nervous. Yeah, you're making me nervous. Okay. Well, we're on our third item. Um, item number 36, agricultural amendments to the zoning ordinance. Chair oh. of ordinance is David. Uh, certainly the planning board has... Uh, proposed uh, revisions to the zoning ordinance regarding uh, agricultural operations and it would seem to me it would be appropriate to thank the planning board for their fine work on this and then refer this to the ordinance committee uh, for further review and deliberation. So I, I now so what I think ought to happen and I'll turn that back into a motion uh, for, the, for the town council to consider. Okay. Is there a second? Thank you. Discussion? I just, I'd just like to say a couple of things. Um, number one, I, I really would like to thank the planning board and Maureen and the Cape Farm Alliance for the extensive work that they've done here. The amount of collaboration that happened on um, Cape Farm Alliance and the planning board and Maureen was, um, was significant. It was, it was stupendous. And I will tell you that Cape Elizabeth is the envy of the state of Maine from an agriculture perspective because people, um, they hear and they see what we are actually doing relative to agricultural uh, ordinances and that we actually walk the talk, that we are putting ordinances in place that will truly have an impact on the viability of agriculture in this town. and. Um, I just want to say thank you to the Planning Board and to the Cape Farm Alliance and um, the ongoing support that the Council gives this. So, thank you. 
Great. Any other comments? Okay. All in favor? It's unanimous. Great. And uh, I would like to echo Penny's thanks to the planning board and to the town planner um, and to the Cape Farm Alliance for all their work on this. And to the Ordinance Committee. Okay, item number 37, Town Center Amendments to the Zoning Ordinance. Back to you, David. <laughs> yes, this actually began with the prior council, with uh, former Councillor Backer, uh, Councillor Lennon, and, and my, me. Uh, we then thought that we needed to spend a bit more time as, as members of the Ordinance Committee reviewing the comprehensive plan as well as the Town Center plan to make sure that we understood the context in which these uh, ordinance amendments were being proposed. So we did, and then uh, Jessica Sullivan also joined us for some of those meetings. Uh, so after we did more background work, uh, we did a vote at our last ordinance committee meeting uh, by a vote of two to one to send the proposed revisions back to the council for consideration and uh, we would need to schedule a public hearing and we l were looking towards uh, the April meeting as the date for our public hearing. Uh, we, just in the interest of full disclosure, because these meetings have not been heavily attended, but I think they will be of interest to members of the public, uh, we are still hoping to get additional information from the town planner regarding some of the properties that may be affected by the proposed revisions and should we get that the ordinance committee is certainly willing to reconvene and to the extent that changes any of our views we would certainly make that known to the council prior to the public hearing in April. Okay. Is there anything that you would um, in this that you would want to highlight for the public so that they would know certainly. whether they'd be interested in coming to a public hearing? <laughs> The most significant issue uh, is the density requirements for buildings located uh, within the town center district. Uh, right now, if a uh, structure were uh, to be built in the town center or uh, modified, uh, an existing structure were to be modified, uh, the requirement is that in order to have a residential unit within the building, you have to have at least 7,500 square feet of land that goes along with that building. So by making the density requirements more intense, i.e. Uh, making the uh, ratio of 3,000 square feet of land for one residential unit within a building, we're actually allowing properties in the town center district to have more apartment units in them. So for example, the building that had been proposed next door to the town hall rather than having four apartment units on the second and third floors of that proposed building, that number could potentially be doubled. And the rationale for uh, allowing a greater density within the town center district was to encourage uh, the development of these properties and to make them uh, more viable for the owners of those properties. Uh, and that also was in we believed, uh, as a general concept, was in conformance with the comprehensive plan, which as one of its goals is to encourage different types of housing within the town of Cape Elizabeth, this type of housing being, of course, uh, apartments. Uh, so uh, in terms of what would be of interest to members of the public, I do think it is that one provision in the proposed amendments. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Can I just ask a question? Oh, yes. Are we going to go after the public hearing next month or wait a month? I would be interested in what the pleasure of the council is. Uh, it, 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 I suppose it's possible we may hear enough feedback in the hearing that we might say, as we did in another ordinance last year, that perhaps uh, some further tweaking is in order or, or even potentially a workshop. I think it might be tough to squeeze in a workshop, but we, what we don't want to do is try to change the proposed ordinance language on the fly. Yeah, I think. So uh, I, I think it may depend upon what we hear during the public hearing. So we'll have an opportunity to discuss it as a council after the public hearing and then either vote that night or later. Or decide on that we don't want to vote that night. Okay. Put it off. Right. I mean, I could certainly see a consensus <clears throat> developing that might be different than what, I mean, it's possible that the council may go in a direction that's slightly different or radically different. And if that's the case, I don't think trying to tweak ordinance language on the fly is a good idea. Then we just might decide to postpone the vote. Yeah, if we, if we were to change it substantively, you know, so that it was a significant change, it would seem to me a better public policy to then 
allow some more time for the public to respond to that so that anybody who might be concerned with whatever change that might be would have a chance to weigh in. Does that seem okay to the rest of the council? Yeah, I think so. Okay. okay. So, um, I'm sorry, I can't recall. You, did you make a motion? Uh, I'm not really sure whether I did or not. So I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Deb says not really. Uh, okay, thank you. Well, I would move that we thank the Ordinance Committee uh, for <laughs> their work on this and to schedule a public hearing on its recommendation for Monday, April 12, 2010 at 7.30 p.m. Is there a second? I'll sec second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? So we'll, we will have the impacted properties prior to that. The impacted well, the, properties? Well, the, the properties. You said, you said that, because uh, that was my question is, you know, what are there potential impacts to existing properties? Oh, sir, I mean, any property within the town center district would be affected by this ordinance change. What, I, what may have not been clear in my comments is there, there were a couple of properties that have yet to be developed okay. that, we'll that may, that we've, we've asked them to give us information as to whether they not only think this is a good idea, but how that would impact their ability to develop the properties. And it's, up to, it's entirely voluntary as to whether we get that information from them. Okay. But should we get that information, then the Ordinance Committee may decide to meet again prior to April 12th. Okay. <coughs> Frank. And really following up on Sarah's question about the voting, I'm wondering if this might be a good opportunity for us to establish in advance, um, establish in advance the notion that if there are, um, well, that, that the hearing night is a night, the opportunity for members of the community to come and speak about this to potentially influence the uh, opinions of the council and then the following month for us to come back and vote on it. And we talked about this in our goal setting where we didn't want to present the, the um, uh, as much as we could to avoid a situation where it, it appears certainly that we've come with our decisions already made, people speak, and we vote regardless of what we heard. Uh, I understand. My only concern, I, I mean, it's fine with me. I don't care if we wait another month. It doesn't really matter to me. My only concern would be if by some, reason, some chance nobody shows up. Mm -hmm. I mean, if nobody shows up to speak, as sometimes happens, may not happen with this one, but it sometimes happens. If they've got 30 days notice and then somebody, you know what I mean, and right. nobody speaks or we have one person who speaks and then to wait another 30 days. But if we want to wait another 30 days, it's fine with me. Is there any issue with waiting? I, I, other things I'm inclined up? to give it that extra, extra time if we could. Again, going back to one of our original objectives is to be much more open and transparent. But but also from the ordinance committee standpoint, we directed the, the planner to, to, to dig into this a little further for us. And there may be a possibility for us to have another ordinance committee meeting to, re, to uh, reconsider right. the vote we just took. Is that, is that, is that your I, understanding, David? I, I think the, I, that is generally my understanding. Um, but to answer Frank's question, I. I the reason we decided to move forward with the vote was so that we could have the public hearing in April rather than sort of pushing a public hearing on this until May, which then we get into the whole budget schedule. Right. And mm -hmm. so I have no problem having the public hearing in April and then doing the vote in May. Um, I just, I don't, like you, Ann, I don't know how many people we're going right. to hear from. Right. It could be zero or it could be. 30. Right. Um, and I think, I think the inefficiency that it creates is only the few minutes it may take to take the vote in the May meeting, because it won't fine. be a meeting without, which will encourage no, a lot does of Does anyone people. have any objection to doing that? No. no. Then right. we can, I don't know if we have to make that part of our motion, but Sarah? I just have a request. When Maureen's gathering information, I'm curious to know how it impacts the required number of parking spaces. I assume it does. If more people live there, there have to be more places to park, but there must be a rule and a code. Well, my understanding is that the parking is a function of what the businesses are and on the first level of these multi-use buildings, uh, but the, the where the parking would be, i.e. behind the building, all those requirements would be the same whether there's three units or ten units in a particular building. But, it would, but would it require more spaces to be put in? 
Potentially. If, if there were more units. So if there were more I'm units. I'm curious what, there must be a rule for every unit, there must be two spaces or whatever. Is when I, would I'm sh it's in I have a feeling it's in, already in the. It's, a, it's already in the ordinance. In the but generally, for example, if you had a, say, a restaurant that was open during the day or a business that was open during the day, that requires a certain number of spaces. More spaces than But because evening. the evenings they're not in operation, then. The, it, it's sort of the, those spaces can do double duty, if you will. It's, it's I very. I mean, as a as parking the, is contingent upon right. the uses of the building. And as a new person to this thing, it is the parking stuff is extremely well defined in there. Right. I mean, you sort of need to. I'm have just a wondering, is it going to double it, but, the, the, yeah. the, the asphalt, or is it? I mean, I just well, like, so like maybe Sarah, one the, thing she can address. The building next door, when that was originally approved, there was some shared parking with the town, with our parking spaces directly behind this building. That was part of the agreement so that there wasn't more hot top, if you will, or McAdam put on that property. So that was developed, and then they, some of the parking requirements were coming from the shared arrangement. So, good question. Yeah. Okay. So it's been moved and seconded. And this is, I don't know if we need to make it part of the motion, but with the understanding that we will have the public hearing next month, and then the, we plan to have the actual vote on this at the following month. That's the plan. I'm happy to accept that as part of my motion. Fine. Okay. okay. I, don't, I can't remember who seconded it. This guy did. You'll accept that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's been amended. Um, all in favor of the underlying motion? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, item number 38, Thomas Memorial Library Circulation Policy. Jay, do you need to introduce this, or, uh, or are you just here to answer questions? Does the council need to have a, a presentation or want to hear anything from Jay before we move to a motion? I'm not hearing that we need just very briefly, I, uh, the library's having modern-day record circulation as a result of the economy, and so it's important that these policies be kept up to date, particularly with some of the challenges we're having with, with the distribution system uh, for the interlibrary loan. Uh, the contractors, uh, for the second time in a year, have tried to renege on the contract. So uh, it's important that our circulation policies be up to date and we're, we're ready to respond to that. And Jay provides statewide leadership on some of those issues and really appreciate his efforts. Great. As I understand it, this is um, a way to sort of uh, um, standardize the Minerva rules versus our rules about circulation. Yes. I'm sorry, Jay, I think you got to come up to the microphone. Otherwise, the public can't hear you. We knew we'd get you up here. <laughs> <laughs> There's no escape. Good evening. Uh, in January, one of our trustees came to us with a request uh, reflecting uh, a comment that had been made uh, in the general public as to whether or not it might be possible to bring our in-house rules into conformity with the rules that govern interlibrary loans for uh, all the Minerva traffic. As the council may be aware and the public um, may not be aware, at this point almost 20% of our total circulation uh, involves interlibrary loans. Um, we will go well over 150,000 CERCs this year and of that um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30,000. Uh, will be interlibrary loans. Uh, so what we are proposing is to uh, change our circulation period on all print and non-print materials. Um, we will be moving to a first circulation of three weeks for most items uh, with one renewal of two weeks. Uh, the end result for the public will be that uh, we will reduce the total amount of time that a book or uh, item could be checked out by one week. Uh, but on the other hand, we will enable the public to avoid um, the first renewal. Uh, we find that actually what, what people are doing, because our, our CERC period now is two weeks, people are 
uh, inevitably uh, forced into one renewal anyway, and then maybe into the second. Uh, the hope here is that you know people will just be able to deal with the first circulation period. So the council may expect that there will be a drop in the overall circulation numbers in the uh, coming statistical year um, as those first renewals are reduced. Any questions for Jay? Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. Do I hear a motion? Jessica? Um, I uh, move that we uh, accept the proposed amendments to the Thomas Memorial Library circulation policy. Okay. Is second. There, second. Any discussion? And moved and seconded. Hearing no discussion. All in favor? It's unanimous. Great. Thank you very much, Jay. And please thank the trustees for us, too. Item number 39 has to do with the proposed fiscal year 11, uh, 2011 municipal budget and the special funds budgets. Michael? I want to speak just very briefly to this to say that I think this, this budget is the envy of a lot of other communities in that it, it, there's uh, no tax increase, there's no spending increase, and yet it, it, and there's also no service, there's not only no service reductions, but it also accomplishes some positive things in helping to meet the, some needs for the needy people by increasing general assistance. Uh, it, it deals with health insurance again, which just shows the importance of the discussion earlier. Uh, it uh, provides funding for Family Fund Day again, which wasn't in this year's budget. That helps uh, all the booster clubs to be able to raise money for all of their activities. Uh, it also, I think, more fairly uh, treats the school department in response in respect to school network assistance. Jason from the school department affects our camera operator uh, producer this evening. And, you know, because we were able to provide 10,000, uh, 12,200 extra to school network assistance when the schools were looking at uh, some severe reductions uh, very recently, that was an area being targeted. And now we can, you know, Alan, you know, tells me that we're going to be able to maintain the staff because of this, which that's very much needed. It also makes a lot of technical changes uh, that are in response to the council's goal uh, in, in making sure that costs are properly allocated and being shown in the right place. But I uh, really want to thank uh, all the department heads. Uh, you know, they, they did a, a great job in uh, recognizing the restraints uh, that, we, you know, that we continue to have. But, you know, it, but the good thing about this budget we're getting the benefits of the bad economy, as opposed to last year when we get nothing but, but the pain of it. Uh, and those benefits are we, we're really taking key advantage of an ag aggressive bidding environment to reduce a lot of costs. We were able to refinance debt because long-term interest rates were so low. That really saved us a, a, a bundle of money, about $150,000. Uh, but, you know, I'm still very disappointed uh, in the budget that there are not any pay adjustments uh, for non-union personnel, nor are any amounts provided to provide increases following negotiations uh, with the Teamsters Union, with Public Works. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that some, you know, we may be able to uh, continue to look at those issues as we uh, as we look at this this budget. Also, really pleased that the capital improvement plan, uh, after going down so many years, actually is is proposed for, you know, a a, a a good increase in, in addressing uh, pursuant to the latest council workshop with the library, uh, providing $50,000 in funding uh, to help with the fundraising consultancy effort that was recommended by the trustees, uh, as well as uh, to, to get some more designs to look at, you know, long term what the library is doing. So uh, we don't have exact estimates back yet from, uh, from companies to do that, but Jay is working on that. But I'm very pleased in, with the way the budget turned out. look forward to working with all of you, and particularly Sarah, as uh, chairman of the Finance Committee, um, in the next month. So, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, do I? Yes. Mr. Prince, come forward, please. I'm the painter on the neck of Two Rocky Hill Road. I've got a couple of questions, and I want to explain the question first. 
19, uh, sorry, 2008, 40 banks went under. 2009, 140. NBC reported during the Olympics in 2010, 700 banks are going to go under, and the FDIC is already $20 billion in the hole. Now, the reason why I ask that question is we have, if you go back in history of 2008, what was the first bank that went under? It was a bank in Florida that held all the municipal's monies. So my question is, where is a $2 million? I'm not attacking. Just a question, because if 700 banks are going under, one of the things that I got from uh, uh, one of the investment uh, 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 emails I read all the time was, if your bank is not rated B or better, get out. And so that's my question is, where is it? And I don't, I don't need an answer. Number two, on the, on the fork, on the uh, uh, page, I'm sorry, Mike. You had down uh, pull and headlight. <coughs> Donations, admissions, shops, sales, 457,000. I think that that number should be backed out. And the number that should go in there is the number which is actually the net profit. Because to have uh, donations, admissions, and then shop sales, that's a gross product. That's a gross number. I mean, then you have your salaries and you have your cost of goods sold and that stuff. So it really makes that number mean nothing, really, because it's, 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 not, a, it's, it's not a true number. That number should probably be $50,000 as opposed to the 400000 which you, you have down there. And I'm, not, just, I'm just saying, as a matter of clarity, that's all. And also, when, I, uh, uh, when the school budget, uh, when the school committee said they already found, I guess it was two or three hundred thousand dollars, and I'm going off from memory on this, from Medicaid monies, I guess. Where is that money being held? And I don't see that reflected in here. Is, is that, is it, once again, is that money being held in banks that are, are safe? Or is that, and what other departments have monies that, I know we're being used for contingencies. It's not a fund. But I just think as a taxpayer, it's fair for us to know where the monies are and, where, and, 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 and what the monies are and where they're being invested in this day and age. Thank you, Mr. Prince. Mike, Thank would you like to address any of those questions? Yeah, i talk a little bit about the money. Uh, the, the, the town is responsible for all the investments, but it's actually done by Pauline Portria, which, again, going into the cost allocation line going up. Uh, it is all in approved banks that we regularly check. We also receive, and it's escaping me, a securitization uh, for all the monies that are in the banks through uh, a, another insurer. You know, it, two years ago it could have been AIG, but you know. I was going to say, but regardless, that's the issue we're in today. I know. It's but, scary. But regardless, uh, you know, most of our money tends to be, you know, we bid it out to local banks, and it tends to be in, in TD Bank. Uh, because they, they're usually the local. Well, no, TD Bank is solid. I, I don't yeah, it's very solvent. Uh, and, you know, we, we don't go going to investments looking, you know, for the, the, the first bank of South Carolina. We, we only call the, the, the regional banks in this region that the council has approved at one time or another uh, to get bids for our short-term short investments. I asked the question only because a lot of municipalities in Florida got nailed and couldn't get yeah. their money out. And that's the concern that I have. If the FDIC, FDIC is $20 billion in the hole and 700 banks more go down the, the tubes, the answer the FDIC will have is you can only take out, we'll say, 10% or 5% of your funds any one given time. So now you don't have $2 million, you have $200,000, which is available today. Okay? That's why I asked the question. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy if you'd like to get you a list of where all our money's at. No, no, I, I, just, yeah, I, I just want to raise the question so that you all know about it. So I think we're very per perilous times. I do. Thank you. Excuse me, Chair. I just have a question about process. I mean, I thought the opportunity for citizen comment was for items not on the agenda. And I don't have a, an issue with, with Mr. Prince's suggestions and questions. The problem is people out there in the public were saying, hey, I didn't know there was going to be a public hearing. And then the next time you might have six people lining up. So I, I just wanted some clarification. The, the council rules are that um, people who would like to speak on items that are not on the agenda not on the published agenda, can speak at one of two periods, the period at the right. beginning or the period at the end. And then for any item that is on the agenda, if a member of the audience would like to speak on that matter, they are to raise their hand. They are allowed to speak as long as council discussions have not, uh, deliberations have not um, started. OK, thank you. Or not, yes, are not in process. Okay. So Mr. Prince is been raising his hand in time, so we've been recognized. No, fair enough. I just wanted to. And it, and it is limited, uh, usually to three minutes per item. So. Okay. 
But thank you for bringing that up because I'm sure that <coughs> is not always clear to people who are watching. Then that was my, the reason for the TV. question. Thank you. Um, Sarah. Motion? Yes, please, a motion. I move. I finished? You want to... oh, 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 I'm sorry, Mike. Did I cut you off? No, I'm fine. Unless <laughs> we can still talk, right? I don't know if, if Fred <laughs> wanted the Portland Headlight question answered or not, but why don't you answer that? Because I'm I, sometimes I think it's better to just answer these yeah. questions on camera, so the questions aren't just right. hanging there and everybody's yeah, yeah. wondering. So the, the the Portland Headlight budget, as all budgets are, uh, we gross up all the revenues, and we we gross up all the expenditures. Uh, there is a net change to fund balance for each fund, but we gross up the budgets first. The, the Portland Headlight Fund, uh, you know, does have a sizable balance. It's projected on 6-30-2011. It will be $261,000. How much? 261. That's assuming the sales come in and whatever. Uh, this year, it's next year. It's projected to be almost a break-even basis. The lighthouse, because of some of the work we're doing on the property. And this item that you, I presume you were looking at this item, item number 39, um, that had the budget. And this is just a very small slice of what the council looks at. The the whole budget is a gigantic. Number, so, so Frank. J just so it's clear for the camera, the gr the fund balance you're referring to, Mike is the fund balance. That's not the net income for the year. You're saying the total the year, over the years. For the year, it will yes. be about zero, break yeah. even, you said. That's right. Frank. Thank you for bringing that point forward. I think we need to move on. So motion? I move we refer the proposed FY 2011 municipal budget and special funds budget to the Finance Committee to begin deliberation this Thursday. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? It's unanimous. Great, thank you. Um, moving on to item number 40, which has to do with the recommendations that came out of the curtailment public f meetings, the public forum on December 8th. Uh, there were suggestions made by citizens. Michael, do you want to talk about the spreadsheet? Yeah, there's, these are the ones that just apply to the municipal side. They don't apply to schools. The schools, there's another whole long list. Uh, anyway, they, there was the, the meeting back a few months ago, and you know, a lot of people have questioned what's going to happen to all those suggestions. And what this does, it, it lays out that either they're going to be reviewed by the Finance Committee, they're being reviewed by the Municipal Operations Review Committee, they're going to be reviewed as part of the next comprehensive plan if they relate to whether odds and ends, although they could be looked at then. And then and there's, there's, a, there's some of them that it just says nothing more is going to be done. And, and those things, there's, there's a column that explains why, and mo I, almost all of them, it's because it's not within the control of the town to influence it. For example, Kettle Cove fees, the state owns Kettle Cove. We, we can't charge for parking at something right. we don't own. Is there a motion? So the, the process is to, to, to assign these to the specific committees that are yeah, listed the, on the document? The, the suggested motion is to approve the process for consideration as contained in the, uh, s the spreadsheet with this item. OK. It's not committing to anything other than to, to review them. Uh, just, in this these is just saying rooms. how we're going to Okay. approach, attack each one of these. And a lot of them will take place during the finance committee process. David? Um, I'm happy to make that motion, then I'll ask a question. But I, I, I move that we approve the recommended process for consideration of each of the suggestions that are on this, the list that we received as part of our packets. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Yes, you had a question. I, I mean, I'm assuming we're not going to commit to reviewing all of these suggestions, say, within the next year. Uh, I mean, there, there are a lot of them. And so I, 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 we may be able to pick some of them off fairly quickly, but others it just may take a bit longer. So as long as we're not expected to do this. Yeah. I, I think that some of these things might be, you know, uh, I don't know, raise taxes. <laughs> that one we're going to figure out. Right. during the regular right. course of business. Right. A lot of these things uh, have to do with sort of aspects of things that we will be deciding on during the budget process anyways. For example, on Thursday night, you'll, Finance Committee will be reviewing 
whether or not if you don't change town hall hours, you've reviewed it. You know, that's looking at the administration. Done. Okay. Fair so enough. I think we'll be able to check off a lot of these. A lot. Okay. Um, this in the next six months. So. I just uh, I just want to make a comment on a, a couple of them on pages on number one two on the third page. Um, one of them has to do with the lobster and strawberry festival. There's already a strawberry festival in Cape Elizabeth sponsored by the Cape Farm Alliance. And, uh, and we have even talked about expanding that at some point into uh, encompassing lobster. So uh, the, the sponsor of that is actually Cape Farm Alliance. So we can just take the you question mark You can say it's off. been done. No. Um, the other thing is, is that only because I know I was on the group that talked about wood pellets, um, that was actually about wood pellet production and the fact that there are some uh, communities that actually use their um, um, yard, their leaves and grass and um, yard waste to make wood pellets. And um, that there are actually small wood pellet mills that, uh, that some transfer station recycling centers have used. So that's what that was about. And then the Iron Chef one was about, that really belongs with the school, uh, because that had to do with, um, and it was um, the woman who is the um, kitchen manager in the high school. She had talked about, wouldn't it be great if we had some sort of cooking classes and competition uh, to raise money uh, for the cafeterias. So we can switch that one to the school. Send it back. To the Get it right off our We list. have knocked three of these <laughs> off within three minutes. What, what does you, Iron Penny. Chef mean? What's it? You've never seen Iron Chef on no. television? Okay. okay. It's, a, it's got it. Yeah. Yeah. Enough said. Enough said. Reality show. I think Sarah's got her hand raised. Maybe we can knock off another. The, all these for the Alternative Energy have been, they're either right in discussion now or they've put them for more long-term discussion or they've, they've said yes or no. So we can check those out. Yes, we'll, oh. we get their, <laughs> when we get their, their expected next report, we'll be able to make a lot of check marks right there. So, okay, moving on. Accomplishing things. Did we, did we vote? No, we haven't okay. voted yet. Uh, we're moving on to the vote. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? It's unanimous. Okay, we're almost there. Item number 41. Uh, pardon me? Oh. <laughs> Has to do with the one town concept, um, the school town allocation, and Jessica had brought this up. Um, yes. Um, I met with Mike. We met, I think it was earlier in February, just to start the process of this, and Mike came up with some figures. Again, some of these are based upon assumptions, but the idea was to see... The idea was to look at services that are provided to each other in the sense that there are services that the schools receive from the municipal side and vice versa, and to try to put a value to those. Um, so that's what the process, that's what we're doing. And um, this is a, a beginning. Okay. So, Would you like to make a motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion. How did this read? <laughs> Uh, that uh, the last sentence, yes, that we that we acknowledge receipt of the uh, initial town's school cost allocations information. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions? Frank? Um, just based upon what the result of this analysis is, what is the expectation as to what will be done with it? Why, why do we need it? Yes, I'm asking. Well, in the in the um, in our I think it was our initial goals meeting, um, it was a question I asked about uh, basically the financial value um, of of what we do for each other, and it was, it was I was very curious about that and wondered if if that had been looked at, and basically to see is it is it something valuable to do? I mean, it it could it looks like it's going to be fairly close, but say for example. Um, you know, we were, one side was providing or receiving a hugely different amount of support from the other, you know, 
I don't know, what, what would we do with it? I'm not really sure, but I thought it was something worth looking at. Um, and so far, again, it seems to be fairly close. But I think there have been a number of questions from various members of the public over the last well, few years that I know of. People have wildly different ideas about which entity provides what to which other entity. And I think um, one of our town council goals was to improve our financial decision making and I think this is just a tool to provide us with a better all a better sense of what the balance is between the two sides in the one town concept so we have a better understanding when people ask us about it. Okay. Just to follow up, um, Mike, these, these, um, these numbers are reported on the budgets of each. They may, may not be broken out like this but they're embedded in the budgets of both the departments, correct? Exactly, correct. Right. Okay. Yeah, and like for example, internet network use, you know, who knows? The, the schools have some costs for that. Right. And, you know, if, if they weren't providing some of that, we would have to be paying for it also right. otherwise. Right. Sarah, then Jim. I was kind of happy to see this because I think there's a lot of misperception out there about how towns shoring up the schools or whatever. And I guess for me the takeaway was what I've always felt, which is we really shouldn't divide these two things so much and that they're, it's all one town. We have the one town concept and they both very much support and help and enhance the other. And if we could afford a public relations person either on the municipal side or the school side, which we can't because we run so lean, but as a former PR person for a school, we could, we would be able to say an enormous amount, I think, about how much the school enhances our town in so many ways and its vibrancy and the youth and the culture it brings and the property taxes and blah, blah, blah. And on the inverse, how very much that you talked about in the beginning of our meeting, the municipal side enhances the school and the community in that we share paving and roads and caretaking and, and tech people and I could go on and, and Ernie and we could go on and on. But I think one of the huge benefits of this town is that we don't divide it so much that we rather we try to put it together as much as possible and have this collaborative relationship and understand that both sides on so many levels, not just financially, enhance the other side. Well said. Jim? Thank you, Sarah. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> uh, I just wonder, is this going to be shared with the uh, school board? I provided it to the superintendent. Uh, I'll have to check with him to see if he plans to do that. Well, I think in the, in the interest of what Sarah is talking about and what we all feel, about our town, this would be a good item to put on their agenda I'll, and have accepted. I'll, I'll let Alan know that you, the council asked. Thank you. It, it might also be a good thing, you know, to I'll, have a little story on the website about. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, and, it, and it's things we share or something. Yeah. Yeah, it's still, you know, a work in progress too. Yeah. So I, I would see this as becoming a lot more refined. But the, that phrase, the one town concept, is something that all of us talk about, and I've heard school board members right. talking about it too, and yet I'm not sure that right. members of the public necessarily know what the heck we're talking about. Yeah, this this kind of makes concept. it real. This makes it, it real. This explains is, it. You know, it explains it. it so it might be worth a little news story. Yeah. Right. So, and I, really, I really appreciated this being done, so thank you very much. But I do have just one question that I didn't see here, and I, I didn't want to make the assumption that it was left out for a reason. So um, I didn't see paving of the school parking lot. <laughs> that was a one-time expense from the bond, okay. and this only lists the ongoing. It, do, it does not list you know, one one time expenses for capital. Okay, so these are it's a it's this is operation. ongoing That's right. expenses. Ongoing so operation. These are budget, operational right? expenses. Right. So maybe I'll just note that. And if we do do a little news story on it, just that might be worth noting. That this is operational expenses. Okay. We've had a motion. Is there any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you, Jessica, for bringing this up, and thank you, Mike, for putting this information together. Okay. Wow. We are now um, at the point where we have our second opportunity for citizens to discuss items not on the agenda. <laughs> Mr. Prince. You would have been disappointed. Fred Prince Maybe. to Rocky Hill Road. This okay. was on the agenda, but I, you didn't I'm ask. Noting, I'm noting. I'm going to be quick. I'm going to be quick. You, I want to get out as bad as you do. This, uh, this was on the agenda, but uh, the cost of maintaining a file cabinet. 
10 to $15,000, okay? Now, this is the documentation for that. How many file cabinets do we have in the, in the town of King Elizabeth? <laughs> Number two, fireworks. I think if we're not going to pay for the fireworks, and I checked the Fort Williams budget, they had $5,000 in for Family Fun Day. That was no fireworks, I don't believe. It wasn't mentioned. At least the town ought to put out something in the Cape Cod or something saying, if you want to contribute some money, contribute, uh, contribute the money so we can have the fireworks. I don't know why we can't have the fireworks. With a $2 million budget surplus, I can't believe we can afford $10,000 or $15,000 for fireworks. And number four, I wasn't trying to attack. But if you recall, when I first started talking a year ago, the state said we're in the hole for $100 million, and they said this will be over real soon, this is all it is. Now it's 400 and it's only going the other way. So we have to make all these painful cuts either earlier or later. And you either face up to them now and, and realize where we're at, or we're going to have to do it later and it's going to even be worse. I'd rather do it now. Thank you, Mr. Prince. Okay, do I hear uh, upcoming meetings? We don't have them listed here, but our finance committee, finance committee first meeting is Thursday, Thursday night, 7.30. 7.30 in the Jordan Conference Room up behind the council chambers. And if you want to see what all the other meetings are that scheduled, you guys can look on the website, you guys out there in TV land. Um, that's it. So do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>